today we've got uh, Renee with us. Uh, Renee is one of our designers and Renee lives in the Philippines. How are you doing, Renee? I'm good. How are you, Cormac? Yeah, very good. Uh, delighted to get this going and get the first one started. Uh, we, yeah. have, we had a full start with Crystal and then she's now moving to Australia, so she's off the radar for a few days. Mm. Um, ha- happy to zone in here with you. That's great. So, Renee, just do you want to just tell us a wee bit about yourself? Just uh, just a quick introduction <clears throat> to yourself. Okay. Well, um, my name is Renee Ryan, and um, I'm from originally from Manila, and I moved to the provincial part of uh, the southern, the biggest island of the Philippines called Mindanao, in the heart, the heart of Mindanao, right in the middle, where all the watersheds actually. Um, are existing right now. All the uh, primary rainforests are still there. And um, through the years, we've noticed the massive depletion of the forest um, from deforestation, illegal or legal logging concessions. And um, for the Filipinos, they still use firewood as their fuel. So we've been noticing that uh, a lot of trees have been cut and um it's it's really it's really sad to see right and experience because the forest is what we need is that's where we observe things the wilderness is where the wildlife lives and we we live in constant interaction with the wilderness and once you start um uh <clears throat> depleting those sources that everything just just um diminishes in um, the natural patterns and processes of of uh, of the area, um, starting with water, and so my husband and I um, we decided to put this foundation up called Hinuluban, which means it's an epic story of the mother tree of the rainforest that sustains the cycle of all life, and um, we work with the seven tribes of Bukidnon. We have seven tribes there. The eighth is the bounding the next province of Iligan. And they've been uh, they've been the original owners of the land. And they've been pushed back by the immigrants and the the government to the forest. And um, whether they they take care of it or not, it, it hasn't been good for <clears throat> uh, downstream effects of let's say soil erosion or that. So um, we've been doing some reforestation efforts with some tribes and have been very, very successful. The thing is, is that when you look at their lifestyle, um, they, since they, they were before in the plains and then they were pushed up to the mountains. So they don't have the same connection as before. They used to just be nomads of planting, slash and burn, and exhausting the land. And since they had so much land before, they would just move to the next and the next, right? Um, they weren't, they were like nomads. They weren't really domesticated in one spot. So when you do that up in the um, the slopes, when you do slash and burn, um, it burns the next line of trees. Every year, they'll just keep on burning. So that's another negative effect that we have with human inhabitants in the forest. So we we decided to um, help them have a little bit more of permanence in one area. So how do you um, how do you teach the people to nurture the space that they're in and enhance it further and connect it to the forest right behind them? So the first thing that they need obviously is food, water, a place to live and then a main crop and uh, reforestation, right? <clears throat> it, during COVID time, I, I uh, was following Jeff Lawton on, on um, Instagram and YouTube. And then I, I wanted to ask him and consult with him about several things about growing uh, grain because we do have this heirloom grain called adlai and 
it was just an hour conversation. But at the end of the day, he said, you know, Renee, I have this course that's coming up. Uh, it's a one-year course, the uh, PDC course. So you should attend it. And I, this, it changed my life, Cormac, uh, to view it that way and, and to understand, have this big understanding about nature and how um, we have to live with it and not against it and, and how we need to give this daily attention to uh, for our own sur survival, not only the indigenous people. So that's how I got into it. Now I'm stuck. <laughs> <laughs> it happens as well. I really so, am. So I, I feel that the 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 need for this education to be given out to, uh, especially my fellow Filipino um, countrymen. So I, I'm I'm putting up the school in in our farm called Tuminugan Farm and um, Permaculture School. So we're we're doing the curriculum. The dorm is ready, and we'll be accepting applicants. Hopefully, starting with the farmers, the ones that can pay can subsidize the farmers. So that's that's how we're going to approach it. Very good. So, uh, were you in the twenty nine PDC twenty twenty? Was it what year? In what year did you? Yours? What's the date? Twenty 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 one. Right. Yeah. So I, I was yeah. I was registered on the twenty nineteen PDC. But I, I didn't finish How was it. it for you? I, I enjoyed it oh. uh, again. Like you, yeah. it's, it's it it uh, does change your perspective and everything. Um, I'm in a, I'm in a completely different circumstance. I'm in a small like urban garden. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, I'm limited in what I can practice. But it's still, as you say, it opens your mind. It changes your mind, and mm -hmm. just the I like the the format of it. Just the the. So sort of the weekly classes and you could participate mm -hmm. every week if you wished. And if not, you could catch up. And then mm -hmm. was the final design exercise was a good exercise. Um, mm -hmm. Now I missed the hands-on aspect of it, but um, one day I'll probably do a hands-on PDC if I get a chance. So you discovered then, <clears throat> but you said you, you were already thinking in this way and then you discovered permaculture. So it was permaculture. Yeah, you know, it's solution. sort of like... Uh, yeah, it's permaculture. Um, obviously, um, if you observe nature and try to work with it, then you'll you'll get to understand all the principles in time <laughs> <laughs> through mistakes and uh, trials and errors. That's that's how because you know we're very proud people, right? So we think we know everything, but nature is the one that teaches you. However, when I when I learned um, uh, to apply the principles of permaculture, learning from Jeff Lawton and, and other permaculturists online, um, uh, it just made so much more sense. It gave me structure, um, and you never see the landscape the same again. It's like everything's wrong now. We have to change this. <laughs> so you have this whole like avatar you know, perspective of life, like a film of understanding in front of you. And when you're traveling through through um, uh, the islands here, you're like, this should be that and that should be there. The pond, why is that pond there? It should be down here. <laughs> Sometimes it hurts my head traveling. <laughs> and and when when you see something working, you're like, wow, this is amazing. People should see this example or this model. So um, putting up models and and uh, uh, opening people's eyes and minds to see the the world in a permaculture way in a permanent uh, a, a, a landscape of permanence um, is just very very um, riveting for me. You know, that's I think that's the word. Yeah, I can understand. Um, mm -hmm. You do look at things completely different. And did you um so when you done the PDC, you you already had enterprises on on the farm? Did, yeah. did it did it change mm -hmm. did doing the PDC change the way you operated as a business and, and, and operated? Oh definitely. My, well, first of all, my kitchen garden is now beside my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, um growing up I thought, you know, this is your house and the farm should be far because it's smelly. Yeah. You get what I mean? So yeah. 
that's and then and then you realize that if you know how to take care of your waste properly it's actually part of the nutrient cycle and the closer the kitchen garden is to your house then the more you'll tend to it it just makes sense right before um i would probably visit visit the vegetable garden like two or three times a week now it's like daily <laughs> right <laughs> So it's prettier now. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the biggest things I, I learned from the PDC was like the you have your garden on the way to tend your chickens. So you pick your eggs, eggs up and then when you're walking back, mm -hmm. you pick your vegetables up and you're in the house and it's tying amazing, all them yeah. elements in the same place. It makes sense. And um, just working as humans within that environment, it, it changes your perspective and everything. And I always put that in, try and put that into my designs whenever I can. Well, I have, you have to put it in. So it's, 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 I'm always thinking about it. Um, mm -hmm. It makes life easier. And, and the web of all the elements, you know, uh, the positioning of all the zones, uh, the elements of sunlight and wind, um, it, it's really the strength of what permaculture is all about. Permaculture design is all about. Now, um, most people, um, uh, you know, have a very segregated way of viewing uh, production, especially the industrial agriculture uh, uh, students that come to our farm as um, on the job training, we have OJTs that come and, and uh, they're really blown away about the, the mindset, the, the thinking, uh, the analyzing, the planning, the design of permaculture compared to the industrial one, like, you know, for them, um, they're taught that to make chickens or eggs, you, you'd have to learn how to be either a breeder or a hatchery. <laughs> and then you wait for the feeds to come, right? A broiler. Uh, and they're all segregated. So the farmer doesn't actually learn how to farm. They just learn how to be part of the chain. Right, while um, the integration of animals into the farming system, um, it's like right now I can I can uh, I view farms. If you, if you don't have animals in the system, it's not a farm. You get what I mean. So and I love the integration. Even the eggshells are uh, made into calcium phosphate. The manure is added into the compost. It's hard to get phosphate in in um in the compost unless you have chickens, right? Or bats. The guana had the the manure of the bats also have that. So you, have, you can design bat houses near uh, your kitchen garden because we have lots of bats in our space. So it makes um you know you feel like Pocahontas after a while. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. it's nice it's a, it's a lot of fun and it it's a uh, it's also good for the mind and the soul so putting it all together i wish everybody would take permaculture really yeah it's, it's good now i think it's been it's coming more popular now and i think we just have to take responsibility ourselves and teach your kids and do what you're doing yourself is teach people and bring them on site and show them was there any, what, uh, you mentioned the kitchen garden, was there any major changes to your commercial side of your operation? Would there be a good example? The commercial so side, yeah. So, um, for example, when we grow this grain, um, it has to be grown upland near the forest by with a lot of rain um, because this, this grain, this heirloom ancient indigenous grain, it's called Adlai, or in, in around the world, it's uh, scientifically named uh, Job's Tears or Joby Croix Lacrima. And it's a super food and it has a, a very, very big potential for the worldwide market. It has um, the nutrient density of Adlai is higher than quinoa. So, and has lower uh, glycemic index. So it's very, very good carb or carbohydrate for people that have diabetes or who want to lose weight. Um, and also it gives a lot of energy. You don't need to eat a lot of it. And the caloric intake is very 
little compared to even couscous so uh, or or amaranth or farro um, we made a big comparison actually a very interesting crop it's been in the philippines for like forever that's why it's indigenous and the indigenous people use that to eat um, um, most of the rice are lowland rice um, activities or growership while adlai is highland and that's where the indigenous people live in the near by near like the forest like the buffer zones of the forest so <clears throat> in terms of commercial that's what my first question was with jeff how do you do it in a commercial uh landscape so the first thing is zero silt should leave the land right so you look at your terrain um you have to have a catchment basin of the water that's going to come down because it may come down with silt you have to uh, design and plan the edges. Definitely, you can forest the edges, especially the gullies, um, as permanence. You can even surround the um, uh, growership or the, the acreage, as, as you say, but hectare in ours, uh, with food forests. And then we have what we call alley cropping now. So every other, like maybe five meters or 10 meters, you'll have an alley crop of either flamingia, depending where, vetiver. You can use um, uh, lemongrass, we call tanglad here. And uh, uh, caliandra is a tree-like um, uh, shrub. I think Jeff uses lucina. He always says lucina. This is a same like, same like lucina. It's a nitrogen-fixing um, indigenous uh, actually, it's a nitrogen-fixing tree-like shrub that's very good for chop and dropping. And um, we uh, uh, recently discovered this past couple of years ice cream bean as well. So just a combination of that. So you, you use that to keep the soil there. Uh, you do minimal tillage or none if you can. Um, you can do tillage once. We use uh, in smaller areas pigs to do the tilling, um, we, to remove all the very hardy, unwanted um, grasses. We have a, an acidic grass that is called kogon here, or talahib, that has this very, very thick network of rhizomes that if you pull um, the, the, the kogon in one area, it'll grow back very, very easily because it's connected to the rhizome in the next bunch of grasses, right? So, but the pigs, they do a, an amazing job of um, removing these grasses, eating them all up, um, even the rhizomes and, and also um, leaving their manure behind. And also they do natural terracing. So, they're amazing animals so to work with and observe how they they can be integrated to the perma, permaculture side of um, um, things is, is just amazing. So if I had, um, uh, we're starting this, which I call slow by slow, you know, you have to do it small first and prove it because the people here they don't like to be any anywhere actually they don't like to be dictated this is what to do that they want to be safe on their old practices right um whether it's using herbicide or using uh, a tractor uh, because for them it worked before it's easier but there's this consciousness right now that's actually um enveloping the world knowing that the gmos and and all these um uh, <clears throat> um, chemical fertilizers and uh, pesticide, herbicide use is just not doing good for not only the soil, but also our health because we're very connected to the soil. Like our microbiome in the stomach is connected to the biodiversity in the soil. So um, um, there's this awareness that's coming out now. It's like, it's sort of like innate in people. We just have to spark it, I think. So I believe that the bigger effect that permaculturists can do, aside from designing people's properties or your own, is being a, a beacon of hope, an example in the world, a bright one, you know, to, to uh, let your, 
let your love shine and people will get attracted to it. And then later on, we'll have this what we call ripple effect, right? And um, uh, patterning the landscape from one property to the other, connecting the wilderness. I mean, I'm just so excited to see uh, it's sort of like paradise on earth one more time, hopefully, you know. How about you? Yeah, uh, I think particularly uh, the, you know, with the GMOs and the way that they, they affect indigenous populations that basically that, you know, they're removing the heritage seed and then giving them fertilizers and this whole big industry around it, it's, it's shocking. And I'm, I'm glad to see that people are reversing that and starting to say, right, we need to feed the soil and mm-hmm. saying, right, you, you need more nutrition. So if the soil's healthy, your food's healthy mm-hmm. and, and seeing that mm-hmm. connection that we're eating a lot of uh, dead food, f- food with no mm-hmm. life that's traveled a long way. So for me, it's getting people to even eat a wee bit of food, just even a lettuce that they've grown mm-hmm. in their own backyard with living, healthy soil that hasn't been tilled, mm-hmm. a, a live soil. And the taste is, is unbelievable. And then that, that gets you a wee bit of nutrients and sort of gets you hooked. And and, mm-hmm. and hopefully then people take a, a step further. They say, hold on a minute. That lettuce I buy from the shop is devoid of all nutrients and it's disgusting. This lettuce that I grew out my back is really tasty. There's actually a flavor to it. And when you yeah, tend, tend your garden using permaculture, you get that taste and flavor back and connection back to the land instead of all just sort of living in concrete jungles and getting handed rubbish. <laughs> that's sort of, um, and that's, that's just the way I think just yeah. to, uh, our society has gone after it's like a sign of wealth, sign of aspiration that you don't need to grow your own food anymore. When you're actually, it's a big disconnect. Like we are nature ourselves. Therefore, why would we live and disconnect with it? We have to be out there, part of it. And it has to be easy and permaculture makes it easy, makes it sustainable. And you say, the example of the kitchen garden, you're in it every day. Now you're looking at it every day. It's just become part of your life. <laughs> and, that's a, and that's just it. You don't think about it twice anymore. Um, so that's what I like to encourage yeah. and tell people. It's just, just start off a wee bit, just do a wee bit. And then do it wherever you're at. If you have a balcony, do it in a balcony. You're lucky enough. You have you have uh, a larger scale property. I do. I can do it in my small property. So it's it's just do it do it where you are. And so that, that that's my view on it. So you're um so after you've done the PDC. Uh, you've changed the way he's operated. Um, so would you have any advice for those looking to get educated and do a PDC? Uh, sorry for <clears throat> the answer, but... <laughs> uh, um, you know, the, there's a lot of information out there. Obviously, to get Bill Bo- Mollison's book is is a, um, is a treasure. But at the same time, who's going to explain that to you? It's, it's really very, very... Uh, deep and intense and uh, and set, setting out examples as well um, for people to see it really broadens their perspective of what permaculture really is about. <clears throat> they have a <clears throat> confusion of, um, you know, what, what I like about permaculture also is how you structure the people on your farm. Um, um, there's a big divide of um, the rich and the poor here in the Philippines. Um, I, I look Spanish. I'm Spanish Filipinos. So I came from that colonization time. Um, my my roots are from that, and I really feel bad actually because, um, not only that you know the whole idea before was to introduce Christianity and Catholicism, but at the same time it really um disrupted the um connection of the indigenous people to mother nature you know how indigenous people worldwide they all they all have this generational appreciation of mother earth right they have this strong connection to the to their land and the first thing the spaniards did was actually uh remove them from the forest or from their space and put them in uh what we call reductionas or reductionas reduct reducing them, <laughs> reducing them into a space.
space just to be um, just to be taught another another um, religion. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know they had they were they were doing trading all over the world. The Spaniards were doing that. The Chinese as well. So when you put people in one area, then you'd have to now build, let's say, your church or or uh, grow some sugar cane for trade. That's where that sort of like industrial farming already started, cutting the trees uh, to make big scale agriculture, um, and and then the industrial um, or green revolution also arrived here in the Philippines with Americans and and the Americans, you know like Texas and Ohio, like that, they have very, very flat lands. So this is where the stilling happens. And you don't have a lot of people um, in the Midwest, right? The, the farming capitals of, of the, the U.S. So here, there's a lot of people, but we don't have flat land. So that kind of um, agriculture is, is very destructive in tropical islands because we're all, our landscape is ridge sharif. You know, from the highest point, it's all connected. But so if it's all exposed and the rain falls down because we're in a tropical rainforest, if you don't have um, uh, your land covered, then all that soil ends up in the river system, the creeks, the ponds, the streams, the, and then silts everything, including the, the coral reefs of the sea, right? So then not only are you destroying the agricultural system, but also the fisheries. And we are 7,101 islands here in the Philippines. So imagine that kind of really critical dis destruction that you have here. So my, um, my goal, I think, in life right now is to, to just at least give the awareness of covering your land um, Start small, but observing that, and then and then uh, creating this web or ripple effect from one community to the other. So um, I don't know. Do you feel the fire in me? I feel like yeah. going back to the farm now. What am I doing in the city? <laughs> uh. We've got we've got OJTs coming from a university, so I'm excited to. Uh, uh, you know, connect with them and start explaining what this is all about and see the, you know, the light in their eyes of this youth, this next, next generation of agriculturists. I'm excited to put up the school and work with um, the community. We're going to do a census around, like, find out what do people eat and we'll grow it. And so we have an immediate market, like, right outside our farm. Excited to do that and and um, integrate the cows with the electric fence that I I got. You know those, so you can sell graze them. Because right now in the Philippines, what they do is they they tie their animals and they move them around. So each animal is like thirty minutes a day. So in the permaculture design, it's like it doesn't make sense, right? So you um, <clears throat> if you have two three animals, that's like a, an hour and a half of your day just moving them around. So that but with cell grazing, you can have more animals in, in a, a smaller space and grazing them daily, 30 minutes for like 10 cows. So I'm so excited to teach that, <laughs> you know. Well, that's um, a lot. Of, uh, Joel Salatin does a lot of that, doesn't he? I'm sorry? Have you heard of uh, Joel Salatin? Yes, Joel. Uh, yeah, Salatin. Polyf we pronounce it here Salatin, but yeah, Salatin. <laughs> He's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've learned so much about. It's like, why are they doing that? And um, I I saw Joelle's um, regenerative agriculture even before I'm I uh, got introduced to Jeff Lawton or permaculture, and uh, I was wondering if that's possible here because we have a lot of predators, um, um, snakes and civet cats and and these bayawaks. I don't know what you. It's like lizards, huge lizards that can eat, you know, it's different, no? Tropical uh, areas is different from, from like uh, huge farmlands, tracts of lands. Um, um, and we're mostly in a slope. So I tried that with a um, portable chicken coop, you know, that you move around with a net and <laughs> it was knocked down by some kind of animal and it, it turned sideways and all the chickens left and they were eaten 
by the civet cats and the snakes. So it's it's really different here. <clears throat> the way we do it here is we have our chicken coop in uh, zone one, not uh, or even beside or even zone zero because they're sometimes underneath their houses eating the termites. We have lots of ants and termites in the Philippines. So the the soil here is very porous. And so when it rains too much, what happens, it becomes uh, drenched and then becomes anaerobic with all that water. So then the insects all come out. And that's why we have our houses on stilts. And then the chickens are underneath and they eat all that instead of your house or your your food up there you know? <laughs> it's different it's interesting so the zoning here is a little bit different but it still makes the principle of design is still the same yeah yeah that, that, that makes a lot of sense who wants bugs in the yeah. house <laughs> yeah. um, so as a as an entrepreneur yourself you, you have businesses you had businesses before permaculture um so so one of the reasons for starting this basically was uh for myself, finishing the PDC, wanting to be self-employed, wanting to work in permaculture. I was thinking, right, well, what could mm -hmm. I do? So I was doing some design work. So we started with a couple of others the, 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 doing the design work. But would you have any advice for people looking to pursue a career in permaculture, about where they start or what what they do after they get a PDC and, and how they would get into business? Or Yeah, you can. I mean, even just uh, seven. 72 hour pdc you it'll open your mind already to the thought process the design critical design thinking of permaculture like for example during covid a lot of people were stuck in their homes and apartments and all that and um you can you can um, start with your herbs in pots you can have little rabbits as well or in your uh, garden um, which will mow your lawn, <laughs> right? And give you meat. Um, you can have, if you don't have a, a much of a garden, you can invite the wilderness into your, let's say your um, uh, veranda, what do you call that? The uh, uh, balcony of your apartment with a bird feeder. Uh, you know, there's so many things just, just uh, not producing that much waste, um is amazing i heard that in belgium there was 2000 homes in in one municipality and the govern governor um or mayor i don't know who it was somebody in the government had this brilliant idea of giving three chickens per home with a small coop so and uh instructed the household that after you eat this food don't throw it in the trash bin but give it to the chickens and they'll eat it and so they they were able to reduce 100 tons of waste in a year from 2000 homes that's amazing right that's that's applying permaculture principles you don't have to have a farm or a big track of land right yeah so, it's, com it's completely daft the hair Joel mentioned yeah. that as well. That basically it's a you uh it was uh, sort of like I uh, you put your try uh, food scraps in a truck and it uh, uses diesel to drive away and you think you're being green. <laughs> That's a fact. You throw it to a couple of chickens, uh, and it's gone. And it's gone. Uh, it's illegal for me to do that here because of bird flu. It's crazy as it seems. Oh, really? We're not allowed to feed kitchen scraps. And it's just absurd. Um, so if I if I harvest a lettuce out the back and I take a bite, I can I can illegally throw it in my chickens. But if I take that piece of lettuce into my kitchen, I'm not allowed to feed it to my chickens. That's <laughs> just like that's <laughs> so bizarre. Wow, that that's that's how bad it is. That's how much disconnected we are. Um, imagine there, there... if all the the law um. Uh, the ones that do the laws in the world would understand permaculture. It'll be a better world, don't you think? Um, without sounding too conspiratorial, I think the laws are set <laughs> up so you're not connected to nature, so you're reliant on them. Yeah. So that they yeah they yeah. don't want you having your own chickens. They want the you to feed into the system, 
So then you're mm -hmm. paying taxes, you're creating, you're, you're building the economy, the mm -hmm. on the paper economy, all this paper money, you're, 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 you're keeping that going. They don't want you independent mm -hmm. and sorting yourself out. We know money flow or. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, that, and that's it's the way they funny want to because, because Yeah. Like our farmers, when let's say, uh, let's say there are livestock people, for example, and then if they don't grow their own vegetables, they earn the money and they spend that money to travel and put fuel in their motorcycles and travel 30 minutes to the next town to buy vegetables and chicken from that system. You know, some of them are even like the onions. I, I don't understand. We have a problem with onions and garlic and tomatoes in this country when we can grow it ourselves. Um, and there's a shortage here. It's really funny. And uh, it's all about this trade wars with Im imported um, vegetables from China. So, yeah. So just the awareness of that alone, when I told the farmers, hey, I'll show you how to grow your own cabbage or, or, or lettuce or whatever, the local indigenous crops, not lettuce, but like pechai, we call it pechai here. Um, um, where it won't wilt or be eaten, the soil is healthy. There's no the rico ricocheting of the the drops of the rain. That's what they're frustrated about. The the soil is enhanced. I'll show it to you. And it takes a lot of churning in their mind to realize that yeah, what am I doing? Putting fuel every so like months later, they're like, okay, Ren. They call me Ren here. Okay, Ren. You can teach us now, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, so, you, so you're going, uh, so you're going through a process then of, uh, you've done your course, you've realized this, and and now you're teaching others. How are you finding that process to get them to change their mind from the? It's, doing the it's a very, farming? very. It's like a, it's like a turtle process. You just, you cannot bombard these people who are not willing to change or listen. Um, like I said, nobody wants to be told or dictated what to do, especially the Filipinos are very, very tired of being dictated to, right? So Hard, I want to, <laughs> yeah. ah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And especially here, because we're, you know, poverty stricken, they say uh, the calamities is what, what makes us poor. But I really don't believe in that. I believe in the power of community, the power of uh, the voice of of a group of people um the filipinos here you know we like to do things together in the in the um, um the west you know you hardly even know your neighbors but here it's like you can't rear a child without the tribe you know we, we pass around the child because then hey i'm gonna just you know wash my clothes here's my daughter you know can you take yeah sure no problem it's like this, you don't even ask. You just hand over the child. So we work together better as a community. So, uh, or the ones with common unity, community. So um, we have to first uh, get rid of like our grievances towards each other. We have to understand and know how to communicate so that when you say things, it's not painful, you know, and uh, not dictatorial you have to just say like hey what do you think if <laughs> we try this instead of like okay guys today we're planting pechai you know it's it's a whole different approach that I'm learning also because you're trying to in it's like reintroducing to them what's innate in their DNA of of being self-sufficient of being um uh and a part of of nature that enhances it, not destroys it, because we're very extractive in our um, agriculture. And we're very extractive in our in our ways. Even for us to get from point A to B, we put a cement road, which is blocking the mycelium system network of of the soil, right? So, but if everybody grew their their vegetables in the community, you'd have less less of this travel or need for the road system. You know, yeah. they think development is infrastructure, like bridges and roads, but I believe uh, we just have to develop our own spaces to be self-sufficient communities 
so that we don't have to be traveling the world or moving produce from one side of the world to the other side of the world in volume, right? Yeah, I think it's about, I think you have to be realistic and embrace what you can grow in your area. Mm -hmm. and, and then the likes of the roads, build the roads properly so that the, there's proper water catchment off the roads. So mm -hmm. then that, that water then can then be treated because of the dirt in the roads, the rubber, and then it can be mm -hmm. filtered throughout the land properly. It can be slowed down. So that's one of the, the things I learned in the PDC as well, was like you using what you have. So if you have to build a road from A to B, make sure it's designed properly and, and laid properly, not just a big straight straight line. It has Definitely. to be the, run, the yeah. runoff is right. And yeah, it's just and it can be an encatchment space for water too, right? Yeah, you can uh, you can uh, direct the water to the canal, and you can use a canal. We call it canal here. You can, but in in uh, um, permaculture, we call it swales. You can actually put the road beside the swale and have a tree growing system. So you have beautiful roadsides with trees that that are just being fed by that water of the canal because you're harvesting that water but i mean it's and which, which mind in turn, blowing which in turn protects the road and and, and flood yeah. and uh and in extreme circumstances extreme like you get cyclones there as it is so extreme weather events it protects the road the road doesn't get washed away because it's mm -hmm. built properly it's built on as you say it's built on contour mm -hmm. it makes sense so I, and then back to the, the trade, you grow what you can grow in your area. Maybe your area grows something better than down the road, but mm -hmm. then that's where the trade occurs. But it, it's mm -hmm. it's building these all these links and uh, shipping food mm -hmm. around the world is just crazy. <laughs> Especially I seen yeah, the thing the other day about, uh, was it something like uh, bana uh, bananas or pineapples picked in Thailand and it was mm -hmm. shipped to Argentina for packing, and then it was shipped to the U.S. It was like, what? It's crazy, <laughs> yeah. It's really crazy. First of all, like here, um, naturally, as friends, you know, we have bioregions. Um, so our bioregion, we have a lot of coffee um, and uh, adlai and, uh, it's be and bamboo. It's because of the, the rainfall, the, the toil, um, and what indigenous crops have been there for the longest time, right? So that's what we grow. We grow a lot of root crops as well. Taro, which we call lutia, gabi. Um, and those are the native indigenous crops. Uh, ginger, uh, turmeric, that yakon. Have you heard of yakon? Yeah. It's an amazing root crop that um, when you make it into a syrup, it lowers your blood sugar if it's high and then it increases it if it's low. It's a natural fructose. Anyways, so you have all these beautiful indigenous crops, but then 30 minutes down um, from our area is a uh, half the elevation and they grow different beautiful stuff like avocados and coconuts and mangoes and um, um, let's say sugar, sugar cane, cassava, all these they even have this miracle fruit, like a berry that turns everything sweet. It's called magic berries in our place. You know, so when my friend comes up to our farm or when we go there, we barter. And especially during COVID, that was the thing, you know, hey, I don't have a job, but I have avocados, a <laughs> lot of them. What do you have? You know, yeah. it was a great exercise for a lot of us in the Philippines during COVID. And I, I think now is the right time for people to embrace permaculture even more yeah i think i think it, it's the tide starting to change and uh mm. on a more positive note that is i think people more people are realizing and even here i am now they're opening up a, a big permaculture farm and it's mm -hmm. the, the local councils getting involved in it and it is uh they're trying to get people to grow in their garden and it's it's a great solution for poverty um mm -hmm. i grow i live in one of the it's like a economically deprived area and mm -hmm. when you look around all the greenery, it's grass, it rains, it's mm. uh I'm in a temperate climate here, so you can grow with season extension, uh stuff you can you can grow like you have a great growing season. But there's people mm -hmm. in poverty and there's people going to food banks, that's crazy. 
and it's like they could grow their own food quite cheaply and this mm-hmm. needs to be rolled out so i think that the the local council is going that way um so what, what's your plans have you any big plans now for the next few years what was on, on um, to, to, well, to that, confirm your... aside from teaching aside from teaching it i really um i really want to see it and uh, this permaculture being applied in the island tropics because we have beautiful small islands here that can be off grid and planned sustainably and that will be enhancing more and be part of like an agri eco uh natural tourism you know our country is so beautiful we shouldn't be poor we should be uh, uh what paradise is to most people you know when people come to the philippines they're attracted because of the foliage the, the flora the fauna the, the sights the smells the water water everywhere we have rivers and uh lakes and um and beautiful diving areas so we have to preserve uh the islands and the midlands and the highlands and our watersheds i i really want to before i die have some kind of influence that way whether it's small or big i just won't stop my my mouth <laughs> <laughs> well keep going and keep, keep, keep at it and uh that's that's all you can yeah. do uh so where, where, where can listeners find you or uh, are you online your, your social media um, i just have i just have my um my personal um instagram account which um is it's really just personal it's renee perrine or renee a perrine on instagram and on facebook it's my uh, full name, but we do have a community on Facebook which is called Tuminugan Farm per- Permaculture School. So um, you can, there's a lot of local members there. Um, I started over COVID just giving advice on how to plant all these indigenous vegetables to, to sustain themselves over COVID, and it helped a lot of people. And over COVID, we also built the school. So um, after I'm done with the curriculum, uh, which is a for for the Philippine tropics or for the tropics, because it's like I mentioned a while ago with the chickens, it's really different from from um, other uh, other areas, you know, other landscapes in the world. Um, so yeah, uh, we'll be launching the school and we'll get some. Um, uh, farmers nearby, hopefully first, and then the people, whoever wants to learn permaculture, to apply it in their own landscape, their own land, their own properties, you know, or homes, uh, or even something to teach their own children and how to survive. It's like life skills, you know. Um, it's really important. So seven to ten or twelve day courses is what we're going to be doing soon. Um, I also want to engage more with the youth, like make make a permaculture and uh, maybe a, a game app. That would be great, right? Um, and or or apply artificial intelligence and like avatar, like before and after, <laughs> you know, so so that people can read. Oh, that's what permaculture is all about. Okay, I'm in. Let's do this, right? <laughs> yeah. So those are sort of like my big broad stroke plans but um within this month is is starting off with the with the OJTs the on the job training um people so that that's about it i'm i'm on the farm pretty much all the time and we have tours on saturdays which i give myself um we have a place to stay so that's tuminuganfarm.com as well um we have different <clears throat> price points you know like uh, high-end uh, farm living homes to backpackers on uh, that that you know can't afford but can but can also have access to the farm and nature so yeah it, people are coming for retreats and um, reunions and just just chill or find themselves again so please do come you'll see me there <laughs> go travel here Carmack. Come, come it, yeah, it might be cold there. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's nice and warm here all the time. I think the Philippines gets a a bad reputation for travel. 
Um, but like I, I grew up at the tail end of the Troubles in Northern Ireland and a lot of people wouldn't come visit. I'm like, there's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's just, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother me going there and visiting. Uh, I yeah. just thought uh, maybe when we get a designer to you, we, we can use that and come visit. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, um, <clears throat> um, since my, my focus is on education, um, I decided to partner with you guys, right? Vinepermaculture.com. And this is where we can service people, a lot more people on how to design their properties in a permaculture way. People might think it's expensive here, especially because it's on a dollar rate, international rates or whatever. We can always discuss discounts. There's no problem. But the thing is, is that it's going to save you time and money if it's actually designed by someone, unless you want to learn it yourself that, or make the mistakes yourself like I did in the long run believe me you <laughs> you have you have to have some consultancy at least with us so that you can um <clears throat> not do the mistakes and start off in the wrong foot I mean um like I have some neighbors here and they were digging their pond and it was like on the middle of the ridge right instead of the catchment area and they spent so much money on that already um or fencing now they have to cover that and 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 redo it right so you're you're wasting money you can't direct water where it doesn't naturally flow it doesn't make sense so they have to redo it so that's twice the time that you need to uh, again dig cover replant dig again <laughs> you know for the pond or the reservoir and number one thing in planning is water so if you don't have a good catchment system in your space then you're wasting your time from the get-go if you're if you're uh, uh fencing oh my gosh fencing here people want to fence like white picket fence hello guys we're not in north carolina <laughs> <laughs> we're in the tropics you know uh, we use whatever is needed to do fencing here like for example we have what we call bamboo tunic right and or the crown of thorns of bamboo and if you plant it near each other then it becomes like a solid um fencing impenetrable fencing but then you can also harvest it and and have construction materials so the the principle or the ethics of combining systems and uses uh, in trophic levels or what we call here patong patong or one on top of the other, right? So so there's ten purposes in whatever you're doing. You're not wasting time. You're you're adding yield wherever you're you're going. So it's not just because um, you know there's a lot of landscape designers, beautiful landscaping, but man. Uh, the expense of that and why go all the way up there or down here you know when you you can make pathways that uh, go with the landscape and the terrain um, um, and it'll be easier for people to traverse in our ridge to reef uh, kind of landscape here instead of making it so difficult for your neighbors your guests your tourists that come to your place you know um, stuff like that so it's really, really worth it. Take a take a look at vinepermaculture.com dot um, and see our packages there. But mostly, um, <clears throat> mostly, you know, it'll be fun consulting at least. Let let us come to your area, talk to you about the space that you have there, give you some inspiration, um, hints on what what can be done in a general scheme of things. And then the most exciting part is when we start designing and we have a whole team behind us with Crystal and Cormac and Callan who are very well um, uh, educated and, and learned and wise about permaculture design. So you, you have them and uh, um, the tropical brain of mine put together. Oh my gosh, you have the best master plan. Um, <laughs> right your own yeah. master plan that you can show off to everybody which will really change the world be this example be the light 
in your space of permaculture and let's connect one property to the other to create paradise again here on earth, right? So that's that's where you can find us to vinepermaculture.com. Yeah. Uh, we also have a pretty special ed program as well, for, uh, like a youth education program. So it's vinepermaculture.com forward slash special mm-hmm. ed. And we also run the free classes, the lunchtime learning, 20 minutes every week. If you just want to check it out on YouTube, it's at Fine Permaculture. Renee, thank you very much for your time today. It's been very enjoyable and it's great to hear your story. And yeah, my pleasure, really. And I and uh, uh, do email me also at Renee at my, per, perma, uh, my personal farmer dot net. Yeah. All right. That's Thank great. you, Cormac, also for your time. It's been a pleasure um, talking about permaculture. Have a beautiful evening and a good day for me. Uh, good day. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>